There are so many hidden secrets and strange happenings that go down in the final scene of Carrie, so stick around to the end of this video if you want to see me analyze it. This video is sponsored by Privacy.com, who are offering a few new product options, so keep watching to learn more. As a special treat for my Things You Miss viewers, you'll get $5 to spend on your first purchase. Free money that you can use to purchase anything online. Go to Privacy.com slash World to sign up now. I've covered the Stephen King universe a lot here on this channel, but one thing that I've yet to do is take it back to the creation of this universe. I'm not talking about God, the almighty being in King's writing, I'm talking about when King himself actually created the universe by writing his first novel, Carrie, which was published in 1974. The first movie adaptation would come out two years later, so let's get into the things you missed. The movie begins in Carrie's gym class, where we learn that she's basically an outcast among her classmates. She showers alone in the locker room after all the other girls have cleared, but in the background, there's a poster advertising the senior prom to take place on May 25th and later become the climactic scene of this movie. The poster is light blue, with text printed on cloud designs, and it would be the rain-like downpour of water sprayed by Carrie using her telekinesis that sparked the electrical equipment and started the tragic fire at the prom. The poster's color scheme, light blue and white, comes up again and again to symbolize an innocent purity. For example, Carrie goes into the prom without having ill intentions, and the place is decorated with a light blue color scheme. But the kids who are trying to sabotage her are wearing red, which is explained by Carrie's mother to be the color of the devil. Red. I might have known it would be red. And when Carrie is humiliated, she changes all of the lights in the room to red. Other examples of the good versus evil color scheme can be seen throughout. Miss Collins is dressed in light blue when she saves Carrie from the bullying girls. Carrie wore a light blue dress while walking home after being victimized, wore light blue to school the next week as she rejoins classes, and compliments Tommy Ross on his poem. Tommy picks her up in a light blue car before prom, an event that was Sue Snell's way of making up for the bullying that occurred, and Carrie changes into a blue gown after attempting to wash away the evil symbol of the blood after the prom. On the other hand, red manifests itself as evil, like the red blood that marks the beginning of Carrie's womanhood, and the truck that approaches the house when Tommy asks her to the prom, both of which her mother sees as sinful. In the book, the prom dress is red, but in the film it's pink, but Mrs. White still labels it as the color of the devil. Obviously there's the blood that gets dumped on Carrie at the prom, but there's also the red car that Billy Nolan uses to try to run her over at the end. The quilt at Sue's house at the end is a mix of reds and light blues, which like the novel's ending suggests that nothing has really been solved. Aside from the symbolism of colors, there's also a good deal of symbolism for adulthood. Remember, Carrie's entire manic telekinesis episode is powered by the stress of her getting her period, reaching adulthood, going on dates, which alone is fine, but the stress is multiplied by the humiliation caused by her classmates. So I think it's no mistake that the shower scene that kicks it all off, features a very adult-oriented nozzle head, and is filmed in an almost sensual way. Also, it's right after Carrie literally drops the soap that she becomes extremely vulnerable. If you don't know what I mean, just Google drop the soap. The gym teacher that helps her is Miss Collins. Her name's changed from Mrs. Jarden in the novel, apparently just because that's easier to pronounce. This is also the first film role for Betty Buckley, who I'm a big fan of for her work in Split and The Happening. When Carrie gets ready for the dance, we see a newspaper clipping by her mirror celebrating Tommy Ross for winning the Player of the Year award. It's implied that he plays multiple sports, but this seems like the most generic thing ever. I mean, it could refer to the fact that he essentially has two dates in the movie, his girlfriend Sue and his prom date Carrie. Then there's this strange scene. Carrie's mother, who has sworn off sex as a sin, is seen mutilating this carrot, which could be seen as another phallic symbol. There are a couple more adult symbols at the prom, outside of this part, where I'm not really sure why this much older English teacher is looking at the young first-year gym teacher like that, but I'll ignore that and focus on the curious change from the book. In the novel, Carrie starts destroying the gym by causing the emergency sprinklers to go off, but in the film, it's a much more masculine image in that she uses the ability to spray the fire hose to ignite the chaos. There's one motif that manifests itself time and time again over the course of Carrie's runtime, the religious symbols that are craftily sewn into many of the scenes. Let's start with the devil references this time. The movie that Tommy and Sue watch when he agrees to ask Carrie to the prom is a 1966 film called A Duel at Diablo. The house that Carrie lives in with her mother is designed to look like a church. Mrs. White mail orders her own crucifix, after deciding that the Baptist church in town participated in the ways of the devil, but the movie takes it a step further with its arcing doorways and massive Leonardo da Vinci painting. When Carrie returns home after her rampage, she returns to the sound of church music, and the smell of burning flames from the candles that her mother has placed all over the house, including on the bed. I too like to live dangerously. That's why I live in California.
The house represents a sanctuary for Mrs. White, but just outside of its walls is where evil lurks, as seen by the parking spot indicator that resembles an inverted cross. Mrs. White meets her fate when she ends up being crucified after trying to take down her daughter, who she believes to be an agent of the devil. There is more in that final scene, but I'll tackle that all together when I come back with more Things You Missed. Making purchases online has become the new normal. It's so easy, but a lot of the time I forget to think about the merchants and their data partners who can see our personal information whenever we make a purchase. I've been using privacy.com to protect me. They make it super easy to protect your financial life online by generating virtual card numbers that hide your real bank information. They also let you set limits on each virtual card to protect you from unwanted charges going through. What they give you for free is awesome. You can create up to 12 virtual cards per month. They've also just introduced two new plans. The pro plan is $10 a month and gives you everything from the free plan, plus 1% cash back on all purchases, 36 cards per month, and even more security and privacy features. Teams and small businesses are obviously going to be better off on the team plan. $25 a month, it gives you access to everything from the pro version, plus dedicated account management, 60 cards per month, and transaction limits tailored to your business needs. If you go to my link, privacy.com slash world, you get $5 for free. If you're not going to take five free dollars, what are you even doing with your life? Privacy.com slash world. When Tommy and Carrie walk into the prom, the band is playing a song whose lyrics sing, The Devil's Got a Hold of His Soul. The song is called Education Blues by Vance or Towers, and if you flip the gender of the subject of this tune, it could easily be interpreted to be about Carrie White. Let's roll it. It's talking about a school-aged kid who doesn't fit into societal norms and subsequently goes on a rampage. In Carrie's case, she has a reputation around the school, causing constant bullying and graffiti reading Carrie White Burn in Hell. He's out of control. The devil's got a hold of his soul. Oh. Obviously a reference to Carrie's mom believing that she's an agent of the devil. Also, uncoincidental, I'm sure, is Tommy Ross's reasoning behind voting for themselves for prom king and queen. Come on. To the devil with false modesty. The prom itself is a very foreign thing to carry, and I don't think it would be too much of a stretch to call an event centered around social interaction to be very alien for her. Not you. We'll cover you one day. But the prom scene is filmed as if it truly is another planet. From the theme, Love Among the Stars, to Carrie describing her experience to Mrs. Collins. It's like being on Mars. To the shot of Carrie and Tommy dancing, where they spin on an axis as the camera orbits around them, much like a solar system. Also, we're not going to ignore the fact that there are clearly Dragon Balls on stage, right? Vegeta, how many things you missed in Carrie? It's over nine! But before we look any further into the prom scene, let's discuss how it was set up. When Carrie is sitting in English class, there are a couple of things to note. The first of which is a poster for Hamlet, the Shakespearean tragedy known for, spoiler alert even though it came out 420 years ago, the fact that nearly everyone dies in the end. The shot with both Carrie and Tommy in frame utilizes something called a split focus diopter. Let me explain. The foreground and background are sharp and in focus, but the middle ground is not. Normally this effect would be impossible to achieve because in cinematography you can only have your focal length set to one position at a time. Just as under the normal circumstances of high school culture, Tommy and Carrie would never go out on a date. But director Brian De Palma uses this device, the split focus diopter, to set different focal lengths for the left and right side of the image. Just like how under extraordinary circumstances, Tommy and Carrie are together. You can see it in some other De Palma films, but it's on Honestly a bit dated. Today, if we wanted to achieve that, we'd probably use a green screen. Not that I'd know anything about that. The name of the high school has been changed from Ewan High School in the book to Bates High School in the film. I think this was an homage to the classic horror film, maybe the most classic of all horror films, Psycho, which takes place at the Bates Motel. The music that accompanies Carrie's use of her powers <laughs> is very similar to the score from Psycho. And of course, both movies feature iconic shower scenes. The mascot of Bates High School is the Stingers, a hornet-like creature. In film music terminology, a stinger is a short sound used for emphasis. Emphasis! Much like the psycho-inspired sound that I just mentioned. That might be why Bates' mascot is the Stingers. The idea comes back during Carrie's meltdown at the prom, where she sees in kaleidoscope vision, something commonly associated with how a hornet might see the world. In this scene, Carrie is essentially an angry hornet whose classmates have just shaken up her nest. There are a couple of Easter eggs referencing obscurities from the book. One of the nominees for prom queen 
is Cora Wilson, who we can assume is one of the Wilson sisters mentioned earlier by the coach. Watson and the Wilsons. The Wilson sisters are assumed to be adapted from the Thibodeau sisters in the novel, a pair of twins who partake in the bullying of Carrie. In the movie, Cora is seen dancing with this guy, who may or may not be her date, Frank Green, but is definitely credited as The Beak. Now in the novel, The Beak is a boy named Freddie Holt. He's only mentioned once. He's the first name that pops into the principal's head when he hears that Carrie White is going to the prom. The novel says he's a misfit for his huge nose and small frame, but the movie gives him his own awkward charm. Wait a second, I, I know just the text to for him. Well, what do you think, huh? I like it. I think it's terrific. Look at that. No ruffles at all. The other Wilson sister is Mary Lilla Grace, who is one of the nominees for Prom Queen, although her date doesn't seem to have a counterpart in the book, as far as I can tell. When Billy and Chris are in the car together, he momentarily calls her Chucky. <laughs> what are you scared, Chuck? A nickname he uses a couple of times to get under her skin in the novel. Following the prom scene, there's one more event that takes place. Sue Snell is one of the only survivors after losing her boyfriend and most of her classmates. We see her come up to the destroyed remains of the house. The soft and bloom effect in the camera is very similar to the scene where Tommy pulls up to Carrie's house to ask her to the prom again. It's very dreamlike, but this dream of Sue's will soon become a nightmare. Sue brings her a bouquet of flowers as beautiful woodwind music plays, but wait, these are red flowers, the color of the devil. Something is not right here. The cars in the background are driving backwards, one of which may be the very same car that Billy and Chris used to try to run over Carrie. The religious symbols come back for one final appearance. The for sale sign is in the shape of a cross with vandalism reading Carrie White burns in hell, pointing down to the rubble, the last remains of the house. When Sue steps onto this rubble, something changes. She has entered hell. The scene becomes even more unnerving to the subconscious as the sky turns from blue to black before the final horror takes place. And if you are a fan of horror or a fan of Stephen King, then you're going to want to subscribe to this channel because I've got new horrors every week, including more Carrie coming, so make sure you ring that death bell for notifications. Head to privacy.com slash world to get your free $5, and I will see you in the next one, assuming we both survive.